I'm Ben Ku, and uh, I'm uh, from Tsinghua University. I'm currently working at iCenter, uh, supposedly one of the larger, uh, or maybe the largest uh, uh, hackerspace in the world, uh, specifically, obviously, in uh, academic area. Uh, so uh, we do quite a bit of things re re regarding hackathons, writeathons, and even writing uh, hacker-friendly uh, constitutions. So, cool. yes. And uh, my name is Diego. I'm, uh, I'm also a community organizer from France and I help Nick here and there to build the constitution and I've got a strong interest in everything that is about to be said and discussed here. So you're an advisor for Elastos? Uh, yes, yes. And uh, what interests you in, in, in the project? Um, Elastos is clearly one of the most ambitious uh, operating systems project that I've ever heard of. So I actually got involved quite early. Uh, Effectively, one of, I imagined, I believe that the earliest office ever for Lasso was actually my office. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, so actually, uh, many, uh, many programmers actually used my office to, uh, to do coding. Uh, actually, the, the office is next to my office. And, uh, and specifically, uh, Chen Rong being the, one of the illustrious uh, alumni of our uh, uh, university. So we definitely loved him and wanted to support him in the very beginning, at an earliest stage. Yeah. And uh, yeah, that's basically how, how it worked. Excellent, excellent. Yeah. And you're, you also do some work with community governance models and developing, yes. developing constitutions. Yes. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about, about that work? Yes. Um, primarily, uh, the, the work I do is relating to helping students and helping any educational institutions to have a self-governance or self-learning model. Because I believe that not only individuals should be self-motivated to learn, but actually organizations, specifically schools, needs to have a governance model that allow the schools themselves to self-governing self and also having the ability to kind of evolve faster than the speed of society. Because remember, schools are going to pr produce future productive members of society. If it does not move faster than society, it's actually a dangerous place to be. Because once you get in school, you might be, in a sense, brainwashed to believe in the rules of the past. Right. You probably want to learn about the rules of the future, right? right. Yeah, it's an institution. So, yes, yes, yeah. yes. Interesting. And so do you think that we, that we could use uh, some of the work that you're, that you're doing in, in the Elastos context with the Cyber Republic? I definitely hope that's the case. Yeah. Um, obviously, uh, my, my current student body actually do involve some of them being a pro professionals. We do run Masters of Engineering Management program. We also plan to do Masters of Engineering Design program. That's to be uh, implemented over China over time, um, but uh, we were the starting point of uh, Masters in Engineering Management program. That's actually when the term XLP, Extreme Learning Process, first came about. And I did uh, officially got the incoming students of uh, most of my other students, and specifically Engineering Management Master's students, to actually write constitutions for themselves. So it actually is a kind of tried uh, write a exercise that, that we've done in the past. Can you define that extreme learning process for us? Sure. Uh, extreme learning process is basically a what I usually call a collective learning or so-called crowd learning model as a way not only to talk about the feedback and mechanism for individual uh, process data and also summative data of how he has learned, but more importantly also allow the entire organization to see how instructors and also people who prepare the course or the infrastructure team enable and help institutions to learn. So that these two variables, the individuals and the contextual environment, the team, 
especially the operational environment that must also evolve in order to support learning to a different level. So that uh, uh, it's not just about human learning and human performance me metrics, but also about the behavioral on the collective level. So that's what extreme learning is about. It's actually identifying boundaries of not only individuals, but smaller teams and the groups of teams, how they interact, and also as a container that packages these teams in the learning environment, how this together learns. And ultimately, the biggest container is the internet and the boundary of the internet. The amount of internet information you can access within that organization became the abstract boundary. So that's, that's how I kind of define extreme. Extreme is identified. It's really, it's really transcending and identifying the extreme or boundaries of individual as indication of learning and also as boundaries identifying the capability and performance of team and using data set to compare different teams as a platform to think through and reason about how this organization could change. And can you treat the internet as an organization and try and create like a governing document for the internet? Like, it's a bit abstract, but... I think it's actually not that abstract. Right. Internet as a protocol, IP, internet uh, protocol, generically is a finite set, a rule. As long as you break that protocol, you're out of the net. Right. It turns out to be one of the most direct access that particularly is becoming a governing tool. If you try out your IP address, it doesn't work. Voila, you know you have reached a boundary, right. right? So it turns out uh, it is a very much a precise and finite. And most importantly, you can check whether you're in or out of boundary in an instant. Right. That is the easiest one to check. Right. And then, so this, this sounds like you're doing really interesting work in the academic setting. Have you been able to apply any of this in you know, business setting or in non, non academic settings? Okay, to be specific, I personally have not involved with any business operation. Right. I obviously constantly run small sessions of learning activities within university and sometimes in high school, right. all for nonprofit. I don't occasionally pay for a little bit of expense. I don't do it for profit. Okay. And so therefore, any other activities that uses this model to do anything is not, I don't run it myself. Right. So, so that, that's, that, that's roughly my And are, are other people, are other people doing that uh, or trying that? I, I think I have many students actually came from this process and started companies that are, some of them are fairly success, successful. So, okay. yeah. So, so like, if you, if you haven't really been working too much on uh, real cases, then what is the nature of your advisory position at Elastos? What kind of advice do you work on and what, what is, like, how would you define your role within Elastos? Okay. Uh, for Elastos, officially, I obviously constantly come to meetings like this, talk to the original founders. And actually, this is probably the first time I have more access other than the three, four founders that with extensive conversation. Obviously, I, I talk to some of the founders extensively when they were early. Um, I am, yes, as you just said, I haven't been really, other than reading all the messages from, from, the, from, the, from, from all these uh, different social media, I haven't been involved. That's true, yes, yes. And, um... I'm wondering in the government, like the state government yes, or provincial yes. or whatever government context, if, if this model could be helpful there and if, if that's been experimented with at all in... Uh, provincial government? Yeah, like, like, like official government. Like official, like, government. Like official government. Okay, okay. So there's one thing I'm very proud of to say, if you ask anybody. Yeah. Um, in the very beginning of, uh, uh, of uh, uh, the organiz organizing principle of Elastos, was using the term holacracy. And I offered that term right. and also specified the readings for all the teams. And eventually, I believe so far, at least uh, I just talked to Faye, so Faye is going to be uh, on a governing board, I guess, that uh, she also studied and talked about using holacracy as a model. And I said, as I said earlier, holacracy is a meta constitution. So I actually, I did contribute to that. So, all right. All right. Yeah, yes. but it's, uh, it's pretty meaningful as well yeah. because we are heading towards that, that model, it seems, and if you yeah. put the first piece to the puzzle, I think yeah. we owe you a lot. It seems like right now we're, we're working in the spirit of, of what you're doing, but I don't think we're using the processes that, that you described. No, no. So it would be interesting to to read more about it and, and to try and apply it within the Alaska sure. context. Sure, sure. The biggest thing about uh, Holacracy is clearly it talks about the notion of transferring the powers and also talking about particular meeting structures 
So he classified meetings to two types, governance meeting and tactic meeting, talking about when to manage uh, membership, who can get in, who needs to get out, yeah. and also changing the organizational structure. Those are so governance meeting. Right. And technical meetings are given this task we need to do, who gets to do what, and how quickly it should be scheduled. Yeah. So those are literally like an operating system kind of thing. Yeah. However, uh, holacracy so far, at least the part of documentation I've read so far, does not talk about care very precisely documenting all the incremental linguistic data and specifically the the um, the process data for how people perform their tasks. For example, if you look at the modern ways of monitoring the so-called uh, uh, many, many of these blockchain teams, you actually look at their GitHub uh, commit history data, right? So if it is very frequent, then obviously the project is doing some healthy work. And if it is not frequent at all, then given the claim of they're going to develop some technology and nobody is committing new code, it is an evidence of not working too well, right? Yeah. So those kind of data set uh, turns out to be a very explicit part of extreme learning process. We use MediaWiki, we look at the data, we have daily review. So those processes are a kind of governing uh, hint or at least handles towards to give us navigational power or governance power within the process of learning the whole structure. Uh, Diego and I spent quite a bit of time yesterday discussing uh, the experience of being involved in a sort of decentralized autonomous organization and yeah. some of the challenges that come with that. Um, specifically around, you know, defining roles, yes. responsibilities, um, you know, where it overlaps, who's doing what. Uh, and I imagine that experimenting with some of your work in the context of not just the Cyber Republic, but the entire uh, Alastos team could also be, you know, uh, a helpful a helpful experiment. Sure. I, I think that would be a very meaningful experience. Obviously, as I said, I, I haven't been doing any real commercial work. But uh, the, the general governing structure for any organization, in principle, abstractly, is just OB, as we saying, that whole point of being abstract. However, uh, specifically talking about Elastos, that uh, since it is literally an operating system for all kinds of computational res resources on the entire internet, so version control, time management, and scheduling of resources, and make resources available, actually are measurable and identifiable resources that needs and should be monitored through some kind of data sciences of some sort. So, so if we were able to actually apply that, this could be a very powerful and interesting way of looking into our own organization. Yeah. So that's actually, I believe, many, many organizations couldn't afford to do because the, the nature of the DNA, per se, of the organization doesn't have this embedded in them. Because you can imagine any traditional operating system or specific computing products, physical devices, they are very much focused on the functionality of that device. They couldn't afford to think about the broad social context. However, anything like so-called dis distributed you know, autonomous organization or so-called smart contract or even market dynamics of any kind of resource trading, those are actually more of a social behavior rather than specific functionality. So the traditional vocabulary and product management tool may not be directly applicable. Yeah. So some kind of even more flexible and more meta, more abstract framework might be useful. Yeah. So, so I think that might be an interesting thing to do. Yeah. I haven't done anything, so I have yeah, to yeah, yeah. admit. So. Sure. Well, it'll be, yeah, that, that's exciting. Yeah. Um, so it, sounds, it seems like your research is really cutting edge. Uh, you know, I had never heard of this work before. Are there other uh, academics, other universities, other institutions doing similar research to what you're doing? So actually, I started the whole thing back in 2012, on uh, starting, as I said, in the Tsinghua's uh, 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 original so-called master's in engineering management program. And uh, I actually got a lot of this idea. Originally came from my two, year 2000 uh, experience at MIT's original uh, first day of this so-called orientation program when I first got to school. So in the first four, uh, five days, we had to physically build a full-blown like supply chain system, interplanetary supply chain system, <laughs> obviously with Lego Mindstorm, okay? Right. So, <laughs> so, so we built a little you know, um, robot that does many, many things. We have to write a report, et cetera, and sleep this night, et cetera. So those experiences gave me this idea of applying, I used to be a programmer, uh, extreme programming into a way of learning. So that's why I added L, extreme learning process, into this whole term. But obviously extreme 
programming eventually became agile and now recently called DevOps, has a slightly different context than learning institutions. Because uh, clearly software engineering and agile programming are focused on the output being the software product, roughly speaking. So that's obviously focused in talking about uh, developing of technologies. However, so sorry to interrupt you. Could you explain extreme programming? Because I'm, I'm not familiar with that. Oh, okay. Programming. Extreme programming was invented uh, by, uh, I believe, somebody help me, Martin Fowler, I believe, or one of those uh, top uh, programmers okay. that uh, basically talk about so called pair programming. So, by changing the organizational structure of programming practice, you can improve the productivity. So then over time, it has a lot of uh, different practices. Okay. And then eventually, that turns into uh, these sets of people talked about agile, right. and then eventually got into uh, so-called uh, uh, so DevOps, development operation, right. merge as one. Okay. Right? But all these things clearly are related to product and commercialization of certain kind of productivity. Right. But uh, uh, in the learning environment, the key is that you never alone know uh, what's out there in a, in a box of chocolate. right? So, so then learning has a lot of discovery aspect, right. and you cannot discount them as not a part of productivity. But what is it became a very touchy thing to do if you were to constrain yourself in a product-focused vocabulary. That's why I had to kind of change the context. And to be specific, I think extreme learning process is fairly different from extreme programming and it's more like a government structure, as we originally talked about. It's more like a constitution for learning institutions. So I, I had to say I took one class from Peter Senge, who was a leading uh, management guru at Sloan, MIT Sloan School of Management. And eventually he worked with Otto Scharmer, created a thing called U-Theory, primarily for so-called learning organizations and so-called social technologies for transformative, you know, uh, presensing the future kind of uh, organizational processes. So these things, along with uh, particularly Creative Commons uh, uh, creator, uh, Lawrence Lessig, that his idea about having any organization having these four uh, modalities called architecture, law, uh, market, and norm, this kind of framework, better describes an organization that can learn, that can self-govern. So those ideas are even more, I believe, broadly broadly applicable to, to general um, organizational uh, development. So, so that's why I, I changed the term it's called extreme learning process. Extreme learning, yeah. yeah, interesting. Yeah. And so where do you see this research going in, in, in the future? Yes, so clearly that's another big reason I am so interested in Elastos. Right. Because ultimately to, so the, the idea of Lawrence Lastic's architecture is the notion that any organization must have this technological infrastructure, which he calls architecture, to be pre-existing before you use it as a premises to move or motivate or enable certain activities or behavior of the learning organization. Then you want to use legal powers and law enforcement mechanisms to reward or punish the participants. Then you use so-called market as a dynamic uh, force to attract the exchange of resources and finally then social norms. So, so on the other hand, Elastic, Elasto as, a, as an organization not only provide the technological architecture but it, because it is an operating system technology infrastructure, it clearly is now having some kind of organization and some kind of governing board yeah. and then it clearly has some way of doing market exchange of resources including computational resources uh, in terms of communication and storage resources. At the end, it clearly has a culture, right? So, so these four forces together, that creates, as you said earlier, a real environment, a meaningful, big enough context to test out the theory. Is that just one class, a little tiny, you know, toy-like experiment or something that's real, right. so. But I think, yeah, it's interesting that you're speaking about culture because I think a lot of people are, are approaching this from a very tech-focused perspective. Yes. And I think we, we are indeed building a culture around this yes. foundation. And, yes. and I think this is a very important aspect to it. Yes. Um, so would you have any guidance that we could follow? So that 
about the, the basic pitfalls that could come along the way? I couldn't say guidance. I think uh, it would be too big a word. But clearly, uh, again, going back to Creative Commons, that the CC as a licensing scheme has all these uh, icons and some kind of guidance in helping you to label the product or the stages of, of uh, intellectual results. Therefore, uh, the whole idea of extreme learning process is providing an increasingly more, ever more rich or a systematic building the vocabulary of participants to engage with stages of the growth of that organization. For example, to get students to learn how to write well, not only you have to introduce in some research engines to get the proper so-called reference material, but most simply, before you even write something, you need to choose a set of so-called Creative Commons guidance, and specifically the labeling of share alike or uh, by, meaning that uh, the crediting which person. Those kind of small, tiny procedure, and also a common community practice to be given and known and ref referred to by the instructor so that participants can actually start leveraging existing cultural artifacts to reduce the unnecessary exploration that other people have done already. And this particularly, it is uh, particularly needed in China in a sense that because of the language and cultural differences, that a lot of tried and true experiments is already available and it's really cheap. If you've done this labeling, it will reduce a lot of uh, unnecessary conflict. So those, if there were to be any guidance, the guidance is to, again, using computational resources to extend the spectrum of search and allowing this reference material to reduce unnecessary conflict. Those were the primary guiding principles in, in, in extreme learning. So basically, what I do is in class, make my student, you know, almost in a very bitchy way, do proper reference material labeling. Right? Labeling is very important. It yes. Like. Yes. Interesting. Where you see Elastos, where you think Elastos could be in, in five or ten years, five or ten years time. Yes, no, knowing that the, I did know Elastos last year, right. and within one year, so many things has been developed and changed. Yeah. That I'm particularly interested in seeing Elastos becoming a totally international uh, community in the upcoming five years. And knowing what I know this morning, mm -hmm. um, my my world, I live in China. My contacts, I did obviously attend uh, Elastos activities a few times, especially some of the hackathons, but it's mostly done by local Chinese people. But this time out here in uh, uh, Thailand, that this world is much bigger now. Um, even last night I met a few uh, Chinese uh, Elastos community members, but their world is still mostly a Chinese world worldview. But knowing that you're writing constitution and other things, that this is immediately a totally different level. Because clearly, so far, the kind of people I met in China are mostly are developers who are obviously a very much an original part of Elastos' community. But ongoing, you being a, a lawyer, that uh, it clearly will be a very different uh, viewpoint on what this uh, community could be. So it's not going to be just technology. It has to do, to do with the social dynamics of this whole structure. And this morning, I probably spent three, four hours talking to Faye. And Faye is clearly going to be managing quite a bit of uh, Elastos community over time. And which clearly started, she started this whole Elastos community uh, in, in US. So many things she told me today is so much beyond my uh, uh, understanding of what Elastos could have been. So I was very much uh, educated this morning. And I, I'm confident that uh, this development is going to be very, very big. So, so one thing I keep telling her and hoping that, uh, uh, that Elasto could become is that in order to be a global infrastructure that help many, many communities to govern and to, to not just to govern, to self-govern and to self-flourish, that the, this infrastructure must be safe and must be lively. So lively or meaning interesting. So do something interesting. And obviously interesting not just to technologists, but most important to people who are not technologists. So, so these two safety and lightness properties are the things I hope uh, Elastic in the five years can become its fundamental and also a unifying theme of offering a system of, of uh, operation healthness.
so healthiness. I think that if that can be very carefully managed and measured, and specifically having a constitution that constantly can check, the constitution itself can be literally executed based on so-called the t common term called smart contract. It being pre-written and pre-examinable um, um, during and after the activities and becoming a true smart operating system that governs uh, resources being allocated inside the community. That will be a great, great accomplishment by Elastos. So that's a great segue. One of the things that we've been, uh, we've been battling with uh, is sort of rights and responsibilities of yes. community members um, as well as uh, the holders of the ELA token yes uh, or or perhaps just the holders of the ELA token so that there's there's different views around uh, whether the community participation uh, which would be largely through voting uh, whether your vote it should be ba your voting power should be based on how much ELA token you hold or if, if, it, if we should be finding another process or mechanism through which to acquire voting power, such as by your participation in uh, you know, the Elastos uh, ecosystem, whether that's you know, through creating, creating dApps or contributing code or uh, being an own organizer or you know, any, any other capacity that people can contribute to the project. Uh, so you know, we've been, there's you know, arguments for simplicity of, the, of the, just sort of using one Elastos token, one vote. Uh, and also, uh, you know, wanting to uh, acknowledge uh, the people who have dedicated their money and, and their faith and investment into the project, um, but then also wanting to uh, empower individuals uh, who are engaged uh, and to help to, you know, um, to incentivize them to become more engaged and to become bigger players in, in the community. So, uh, yeah, do you have any thoughts on... on this is very interesting. Um... So you are proposing that uh, the membership came along with your ownership of some ELA. If you are one, me one uh, ELA, then you became a member. That's right. But sounding like your vote does not have to be absolutely bound to your spending of the ELA. Just as you have one ELA, you can vote. Yeah. But your willpower is measured by the number of ELA ELAs you own. Right, that, roughly. That's what what so, we're considering. It's one of the systems we're considering. That's so, right. so exactly. So you are actually saying that this is this is the arithmetic logic of your voting powers, meaning people with more ELA will have more powers, right? right? So, so clearly this is almost like, again, you are the real lawyer. I'm just I, re I read like the first paragraph of uh, U.S. Constitution, right? right? <laughs> that they are free person who can have one vote, right. and then they are like two-fifths or three-fifths of, uh, you know, a not-so-free person, right, right. that can vote uh, s accordingly. And then people who don't pay tax and who are Indian, local Indians, according to the original tax, has no vote voting powers, right? right? So then that kind of gives arithmetic measure for the representative power of the participants. So, so clearly to, again, going back to what I just said earlier, to ensure the Constitution itself has a sustainable safety and liveness. So you have to see, figure out what kind of condition can, can situation happens where people own lots of ELA is going to have the evil will that might break the system. Yeah. So as long as you can figure out the arithmetic logic, knowing that people who own more is always going to do good, or at least good within the context of decision right. um, before it breaks it, right. let's say, and then that system becomes safe in life. Yeah. However, if it is only uh, a simple static rule and assuming that will always work, that is a dangerous assumption. Yeah. So, so this is going back to how kind of decision power, how can that be measured arithmetically? And I think uh, you, you are the, the legal expert. I, I don't know of anybody has fully figured that out. And it could be a computational science issue that can be understood by theories like uh, uh, Byzantine general problem or so-called uh, uh, channel capacity problem, as I mentioned earlier, that uh, there are actually ways through iterative decision processes, you could figure out the minimum amount of iteration or the, the arithmetic you know, logic you require to ensure the information you want to guarantee that abides to the original constitution is always going to uphold or within the limit of, you know, the, the reasoning of, of 
of, uh, of agreement. So only that is examined, then we can ensure that uh, this, this uh, organization is going to be safe and alive all yeah. the time. Well, if we could find an arithmetic solution to these, to these issues, that would be wonderful. Because yes. uh, it's challenging and people have, have different views. Yes. Uh, and, um, you know, we, one of the things we've been exploring is, you know, you mentioned the worry of, uh, we call them in the crypto scene, whales. People have, who have a lot of, of tokens, uh, you know, worry about whales acting out of self-interest yes. and not in the interest of the Alaska's community and, yes. and, you know, what sort of uh, safeguards, yes. uh, checks and balances to put into the system to protect that from that happening. Um, and that has been challenging and, and you know, thinking of ways to, uh, you know, uh, somebody suggested recently to use a system called quadratic voting, mm. uh, where you're, you take the square root of the mm. amount of, of, of tokens, in this case, that, that you would have, and that mm. would be your voting power, and it sort of uh, levels the playing field mm -hmm. a bit, but then you run into tech, technology challenges in yes. the in the Elastos context, um, because uh, if large ELA holders can move their tokens into different wallets, as many wallets as they as they want, uh, it becomes very hard to track. Yes. Right. Yes. And and so maybe there's an arithmetic solution to that problem as well. Okay. But, exactly. Uh, that's that's an obstacle that we're hitting right now. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So see, in the past, this kind of thing will never even surface. Yes. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, one head, one vote is already like a de facto kind of. Yeah. gospel for everybody to believe in yeah, democracy. right but the fact is that we know some voting system didn't work yeah. right yeah. yeah yeah but also i think there's obviously like one of the debates is around anonymity and whether you know i mean i think people are very attached to this principle that they shouldn't be identified through a kyc or any any yes. uh, official documents but rather uh, remain anonymous and still be able to contribute to the community and so I think this is always this trade-off between being anonymous and being able to be part of the community and contribute within that community. And I think those are questions that have not really been explored by anyone else before and I'm really working at the frontier right now. Yes. So, so this will be another, as you said, again, I have to admit, I only work on very, very small, like 100, at most 200 people kind of scale. I haven't tried anything like 10,000 people or yeah. 20, 200. 20,000 people. So those kind of uh, scope in modern day daytime is trivial. Many kids in a dormitory set up a 2 million, 5 million, you know, uh, follower kind of uh, voting structure. That's very possible today. Uh, so I haven't done that. But then that, again, some of these things can be simulated prior to voting. So that actually meant any decision maker prior to voting can actually run a simulation of different schemes before voting then do this. This has obviously been done extensively by many of the modern life, you know, real voting scheme, like prediction of any of the voting results. Yeah. However, uh, in this case, because uh, uh, assuming that uh, every one season that there are 10 decisions to be made in the ELA community, Elasso community, then can we build an infrastructure so that everyone gets to use similar kind of computational kind of tool to simulate a different scenario and propose a possible outcome before the vote, yeah. right? Then based on the simulation results, then we say, what would be the reasoning of the outcomes? Yeah. Then we can actually protect ourselves, again, using computational resources as a guarantee. And this is actually possible. Yeah, that's a great right? idea. Yeah, simulating, uh, or trying to put into simulation some of the, the frameworks and, and concepts yes. that we're working with. Yeah. And provi provide that ahead of time. Yeah, before we commit to, to yes. one or the other. Not that anything is never changeable, but yes. uh, you don't want to be changing all the time. Yes. Yeah. But but it seems that still at some point you you would we would be facing some sort of political decision as to what do we want to prioritize and what type of uh, society we want to actually build because I think no simulation will tell you the right political decision, right? social decision that you should be taking. Oh, so, so I, again, I recently have been extensively reading some of these uh, uh, historical kind of review of major shifts, like, again, by Ray Huang, the uh, historian at uh, Yale University, I believe. That, uh, so it's, it is almost always easy to do, like, the hindsight study. So then you kind of go back and simulate all the historical uh, events. 
and then put together the numbers over time and then kind of assess them. So this is actually the power of blockchain. In the past, if we only look at simulation of one event, it is actually difficult and harder to track what is the exact decision, the, the outcome or the influence, influential kind of powers of the decision. But if you have blockchain and you have some kind of simulation engine that is somehow labeled with certain kind of framework, and it is possible today, I'm not saying right away, but roughly speaking, you can have many, many scenarios already pre-labeled. As more and more events we keep voting and we run different simulation, we literally could search through the prior result and then provide some kind of reference frames uh, of existing and prior some of the past histories and maybe something 10,000 years ago, whatever thing we can get our hands on. And using those data as an, an analogy to penetrate the way we understood and we kind of articulate our voting decisions then people can be better informed with more concise and more kind of uh, relevant uh, decision patterns. So all of the participants can be better informed. Right. For example, many of the explanation of how US uh, uh, voting system was done, they have this particular sequence. They want a smaller state, smaller town to first vote so they inform the decision so that it can influence larger state by the outcomes of smaller sampling, right? But these are still purely number-based and arithmetic. It does not necessarily come with all of the other references, like who the candidate is and the personality, etc. It doesn't come with that number. However, using database technology, using search, using uh, classification on blockchain, it's possible to look at some of a commonly referred to even uh, mystical stories as a way to kind of provide an analogy and see the references and how people look at different things, those things can actually be used as a way to infer the possible outcomes. Right. Then people actually will know the possible outcome before they vote. Right. So they can go into the vote with more of a publicly known simulated result as really literally have a simulated movie of future events to many more voters before they see it. I feel like we need a partnership with uh, you know, some group or researcher who, who do these simulations. Uh, do you know any, anybody? <laughs> Obviously, I'm the only one I know. So, but <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> so, so not to uh, blow my own home horn. Um, uh, actually, I do have one uh, reference. Okay, last three days, I finished the first season of Mr. Robot, and it was done before 2015, I believe. So, in the first season, there were no anything happened after 2016, obviously, right? So everything I was watching the 10, first 10 episode, unfortunately reminds me of what happened in 2016. So obviously, um, I don't think American voters had massively looked at, I mean, in the, you know, 300 million scale, I mean, yeah. um, this particular Mr. Robot you know, episode and directly relate to the decision. If we were to, let's say in the Elastos community, I'm just making things up. Yeah. So for all these, we have three different episodes looking at different things. And then knowingly that people make decisions actually watch a good number of them, watch some of these stories, at least read the summaries of the storylines and then go to vote. I'm pretty sure the voting results will be very different. Any questions, Diego? Yeah, uh, so it's, in a totally different subject, um, you mentioned education, and I think education is about to change dramatically because, it, mostly because of AI, and, and we're getting to a point where we, it seems difficult to know exactly what type of knowledge is going to be relevant in 10, 20, and, and beyond. And um, so, what's your take on that? What do you think we should be teaching people now? What kind of skills are going to be relevant in the, the coming future? Okay. So, so that as you kind of, we kind of discussed in the very beginning, that extreme learning process is about educating an institution itself, not actually just teaching or uh, educating the, the students. So we almost always uh, organize extreme learning process participants in two separate groups, which we call challenge designers, CD, and the mission executors, called MD. So these two kinds of people, almost like a you know cap capturing the flat kind of uh, competition that is literally a penetration test so so 
a organization, a school, needs to be challenged by its own students. So we do it by having, so it's, this term is actually very recursive, okay? So meaning that instructors and prior senior students work as so-called challenge designers. They figure out a generic set of learning environment and they actually try the whole learning process themselves, make sure it works. Ideally, they actually took the whole, whole course themselves in, in a prior session. Then they design a sequence of missions to be executed by incoming students. So incoming students will actually try to learn the skill and try to even, even break this whole learning process. If it is totally broken, that actually meant the intentionally, obviously, sometimes unintentionally. So if it's done intentionally, meaning that the incoming students actually learn enough to break the system, that's the most successful success. If they are doing it unsuccessfully, meaning that they haven't been able to fully understand the whole course. Or if it's breaking unintentionally, meaning that it is broken, so actually means the challenge designers are not good enough. So that exposes the weakness of the learning organization. And then the key idea is not to judge just the learning organization itself. It is having all these data, and now with blockchain, make them transparent to be exposed to the public. So people, oh, this institution needs to patch up this and that. So that data is become transferable to any other institution knowing that this pattern is good or bad, and they can borrow to other institutions. So the entire learning process becomes really trans transportable. And that makes any learning activity became a possible reference for others. Literally in the process of teaching people about calculus, the mistakes or the tricks that's properly done in physics probably can be better used in teaching mathematical calculus. And then that a lot of experience can be shared, right? So, so that kind of data exchange and reference, in my understanding, at least being a teacher, professional teacher, I haven't seen that. And we should do that. And we could cheaply do that right now. So if you go to toyhouse.cc, which is somehow blocked yesterday uh, in China, that uh, uh, we could afford to have all these courses to have one common database. So they can, with one click, in a media wiki fashion, directly see every other course's data. And they are ideally structurally similar in one common you know, input and output structure so that all the learning processes became a learning so-called uh, uh, so, so prototype or some kind of archetype. So this archetype can be always compared and contrast on many time scales and spatial locations to reuse this experience. So I believe that uh, this kind of infrastructure must be uh, replicated everywhere around the world. How, how do you... Um... So this sounds, one of the questions that I always get about like learning anything new is like how do you get people engaged with it? Like how do you get your average person who currently might be totally disengaged with politics or uh, civil society in general, how, how do you get people like that involved in this? Because this obviously requires people to be kind of like involved to, to be successful, right? How, how do you... Cha attack that challenge, I guess. Oh, I, I think uh, this is actually my life. So you are, you, are, you are pointing out some of the most painful experiences in my last 12 years. Because you can imagine, many of us, my students who come to my course are typical Chinese uh, college incoming students or so-called professionals who actually work in a relatively uh, highly industrialized or highly kind of busy a very competitive environment. Talking about civil liberties, civil responsibilities, is not necessarily their strength. They, they haven't been trained to talk and think that way. If I'm coming to a cl class, I'm here to get the highest score, to compete against all these other students. I must be the best, and these other students... So it's not my way of thinking what a good class is. is this. And obviously, it's, it's not about my opinion. It's about how we can maximize or improve the overall learning environment. That's my objective. I don't even have to have them all subscribe to my model neither. So now, now it becomes a negotiation. They believe a very different set of things. And I believe a different set of things. And being an instructor and being sometimes forced to take, teach these courses, I'm not forced, I'm just half, halfway joking. They, they let me do the experiment, that's this way. 
So I'm, I'm happily taking on the challenge. So then in order to kind of convince them can create some kind of conflict. So there are videos of my classes you can, you can watch and it's, in my opinion, sometimes funny, sometimes it's uh, challenging. So, so uh, I, I try to record as much as I can. Okay. So, so anyway, so, so over time, the key idea is that uh, I believe that the school allows me to continue to do this means that it is possible to engage people with different sets of interests in the classroom. That's why classroom is so useful, because it is bounded. So the worst case, whether taking a two-hour two lecture for, my, for me or take a four-day un, unstopped, uh, literally 80 hours consecutive course, that's why, that's why Extreme actually came from. So, so, so that uh, incoming class, that they actually experience a very different dynamics how they interact with instructors and interact with other students. So they realize there are responsibilities that prior to coming to my classroom, they didn't recognize. Then they can literally in the physical environment experience the learning process as a group, not just as an individual. So that civil responsibility comes from real life ex uh, experience. They have to build something, they have to write something together, they have to correct other people's spelling. And then this is not necessarily their prior experience. But in order to deliver something in a short amount of time, they have to do it. So, so in order to do any of these tasks, that uh, it is, in my opinion, relatively cheap in the modern classroom environment to engage large non number of traditional kind of students and even traditional kinds of instructors to create a collective and joint experience in creating this civil society and showing the, the structure of resolving conflict. And, and going to the four basic rights of learners that I kind of paraphrase from um, Richard Stoneman. The four basic uh, parameters for collective learning is first, you have a right to use any open source technologies or knowledge available on the entire internet. Secondly, you have a right to resolve any conflict. Thirdly, you have a right to basically create your, your new rules to engage with other people. Fourth, you can fork and create other kinds of learning institutions of your own. So these four basic rights that allows you to basically continue to engage your self rights and your self willingness to create a society or organization of your own. And that gives freedom so that that provides a framework to decide whether this learning process is good or bad. If you learn something, you really experience something really unhappy for me, well leave after four days and do something better. And I'm all for it. Right. Right. So did you say that first you do 40 hours, the students do 40 80 hours? hours. 80 hours. Yes. They in four eat. days. In four days. Yes. Oh, I see. Okay. So four days it's is... Not much yeah. Four days is really just under 196 hours total. So... Yeah. So roughly speaking, you start on uh, uh, usually a Friday, uh, Thursday uh, morning at 8. We finish usually at the Sunday at, uh, let's say, 4. So roughly speaking, give a give or take 80 Excellent. hours. Wow, yeah. that sounds great. So I, I, one um, question I have is like within the classroom environment that like you can create the conditions with which you can experiment and uh, force people to, I guess, engage with civic responsibilities. Um, how do you do, how do you bring that out to outside of the classroom to ah. the average everyday person? Sure, sure, sure. So obviously extreme learning process originally was built with uh, management of an engineering master's program back in like 2012. But over time, we kind of kind of abstracted into a generic kind of management process for summative data and so-called formative data. So summative uh, process basically uh, is whatever courses you have at the end, what have you produced? And, and so-called formative process, basically all the process data you do during, let's say, either four days or so-called 16 week regular classroom that that uh, whatever you produce. So then we use MediaWiki, we use WordPress, we use Piwik, or now the Montana, those kind of uh, data technology to capture the behavior of interaction across uh, all locations. Obviously, you can do a lot of this work on your iPad, on your laptop. So that that kind of give engagement to people outside of classroom. So that's roughly my way of dealing with uh, not so perfect, you know, ideal situation. We, we definitely are trying to set up some kind of more kind of tailor-made learning environment. Uh, so um, the last uh, two years, we've been running total by now seven sessions of so-called A-Day program for so-called uh, uh, entrepreneurship programs. 
So we invite uh, people from mainland China, Hong Kong, Taiwan, and Macau students to basically come together for eight days. And we bring some of the best the teachers we have at Tsinghua and around China. And we work with MIT's uh, U Theory team. And we have, we have eight days of literally um, uh, sleep ignore uh, kind of a program for seven sessions. And so far they still let me do it. So I, I think it's, it's okay. So. Cool. That sounds like interesting. And the entrepreneurial environment seems like the perfect, the perfect set yeah. of context for that, yeah. that as well. Yeah. yeah. Well, this has been a fantastic conversation. Thank you. Uh, yeah, Ben, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Cool. Awesome.